Hey guys, uh, you're very welcome. Back to day four here with the uh, Rand Online Coaches Clinic. Uh, delighted to welcome Coach Chris O'Shea today. Uh, Coach Chris is going to be talking about uh, developing a playing style and also practice planning. Coach Chris is with the Telekom Baskets Bonn in the German Bundesliga. Uh, he's uh, the assistant coach there. So delighted to have him. Coach, when you're ready, you can take it away. Okay. Um, first, uh, thank you, Nabil and uh, Round Sports Academy for inviting me to give this talk. Um, like you said, I'm currently the assistant coach for the Telekom Baskets Bonn in Germany. Before that, I was uh, coaching 12 seasons in Austria for the Kamunen Swans. When I was there, I was in charge of the youth program. Um, I coached all levels of youth basketball from under 12 up to under 22, boys and girls. Um, I was also assistant coach for the men's team. During that time, I was also six seasons or six summers with the Austrian national team with uh, various youth programs, uh, under 16, under 18, and the men's program. Um, and I'm very excited to talk about um, these two topics. The first one um, is developing a playing style in youth basketball. Um, we'll talk about set plays versus creative motion. Um, first, let me define what set plays are. Uh, set plays to me are offensive plays with uh, predetermined movements and actions, which are designed to create a scoring opportunity for a specific player. Um, underneath, I put in a few examples of set plays from some teams we played against the past seasons in the international leagues we played in. Um, and you see there, these are all designed to get a specific player the ball in a specific spot. Um, creative motion, on the other hand, is an offensive concept based on principles, which gives all players the freedom to read and react to the defense and their teammates. Um, I have also here a clip of a few youth teams or of a youth team playing some motion principles, add some nice music here to it. Um, you see here just, I would say, all random movements. Players are just allowed to read and react. You see here, pass and cut, pass and screen away. So there's no predetermined movements in there. The players all have freedom to read and react to what the defense is doing and what their teammates do. Um, So those are the two styles of play we want to talk about, set play versus creative motion. Um, the advantages of set play, I would say, first of all, it's a little bit easier to teach than motion offense. There is potentially less practice time required. You can emphasize or minimize a player's strengths and weaknesses a little more easily. Um, the coach has more control to dictate the flow of the offense or the actions. Um, you can direct possessions to a specific player or a specific spot much easily. Um, so the coach has a little more control. This can be an advantage in um, critical situations in the game or at the end of games when you want to get a specific player the ball uh, in a certain spot. Um, this can also, one advantage might be that it um, teaches players the concept of roles in offense. Obviously not every player has the same exact skill set. Some players are gonna be better than others offensively. Some players are gonna be better shooters, penetrators, whatever they are. Um, and a set play maybe can help the coach uh, put them in those roles much easily, much more easily in offense. Um, and the one advantage is also it prepares players for the predominant style of play at higher levels. You know, college, uh, professional basketball um, is I would say predominantly run through set plays. Some disadvantages of set plays, players only learn predetermined movements and not necessarily how to read the game. Um, players can become robotic in this kind of uh, offense. Um, they can struggle when the movements are taken away or when they don't create scoring advantages or scoring chances. Um, the skills in set plays don't necessarily transfer from one season to the other one or from a new coach to our new team. Um, if you're playing on an under 16 team and you're running a certain amount of set plays and the next season you go into the under 18 team, maybe you're with a different coach and they run a whole new different set play. So maybe what you learned the season before doesn't necessarily transfer as well into the new season. Um, also players who are considered role players or who are maybe not considered offensive, offensively as important, 
can get discouraged. Um, if you have a player who the coach says uh, he's only a good defensive player or he can't shoot or he can't dribble, we're just gonna, we are just going to design every play that he stays in the corner. Well, this player might get discouraged um, and then maybe he decides not to play basketball anymore. And this is um, definitely something we, wanna have, we do not want to have happen in youth basketball. Also in set play, you have the danger of stunting a player's individuality. The coach says, hey, we're running this play, this and this, this is this pass to happen here. You have to pass the ball here, you have to cut here, you have to screen here. Um, maybe players are afraid to try something out of fear that the coach will get mad at them or a, a teammate will get mad at them for trying something. So the player's individuality is maybe stunted. And it maybe it's easier for your opponents to scout you if you're only running set plays. Um, the opponents might know exactly what's going to happen, and they'll know exactly who will get the ball with which play. Um, what the situation will be, what exactly is coming. So scouting wise, maybe it's a little bit easier to scout a, set play, a team that plays only set plays. Creative motion, some advantages. Um, the players, I think, in my opinion, uh, gain a broader understanding of basketball concepts, basic concepts like spacing, movement, timing. Um, I think a player's creativity and decision making is promoted. I know decision making is a huge uh, topic in all of basketball, and I think it starts at youth basketball. And I think creative motion definitely promotes this. Um, players learn how to read situations, react accordingly. They're, they're pushed to find solutions on their own and with teammates without the coach telling them exactly what to do every time. Um, and in the long run, I think this uh, creates better players, uh, more rounded, well-rounded players. There's maybe more joy derived or maybe the players get a greater sense of empowerment in, in the game and the team's overall success because all the players feel important in the outcome of the offense. You know. One player is not told to stand just in the corner and sit around. You know, they also have the freedom to move and uh, make decisions in the game. I think the most important thing for me is that the, the skills and concepts that a player learns through a creative motion offense will transfer to every other style of basketball. Um, if you go into a set play offense the next season after coming out of creative motion offense, those skills that you learned um, will definitely transfer over. And theoretically, it's harder for opponents to scout. Um, in theory, the offense is unscripted and no two possessions would be alike because you're just reading what the defense is doing. Some disadvantages, um, it's more difficult to teach and can potentially take more time in practice. And if you're a youth coach and you only practice maybe two or three times a week if for 90 minutes of practice, um, maybe you say you can't afford to spend so much time teaching these type of skills. Um, the coach has to be willing to accept more mistakes from the players um, um, because it will be harder to teach this. So the, the, the learning curve for each player will be different. Um, some will understand the concepts quicker than others. Um, and this can be frustrating. It requires a lot of patience from all the players and from the coach. Uh, there's also the potential for short-term failures as the players learn the offensive reads and how to react accordingly can get in games sometimes it can get hard to get correct shots or good shots for specific players the office can, can get chaotic if the players make the wrong reads or if they try to do too much um, and, and this can lead to frustration so i would say these are the advantages and, and disadvantages of both offenses um so there's, there's definitely advantages and disadvantages, disadvantages for both um so which one is better I think that's hard to say 100%. Um, I think before you decide on your own, you have to decide what your what your goals as a coach are, um, what your capabilities as a coach are, or what you're comfortable teaching. Um, if you are a volunteer coach and um, let's say maybe don't have a, a great understanding of a lot of different basketball offensive concepts, maybe it's uh, you're more comfortable and more easier for you to coach a set play style. Um, if your goal as a coach is to move up and develop players, um, then maybe you will want to try to push yourself to learn and to teach a creative motion style offense. Um, on top of that, I think it's important to understand what the goals of your club or your team is. Um, maybe you have a club whose goal, you, the stated goal is to develop players to play at a professional level of basketball. Well, in, in order to do that, uh, you probably need to teach players the all around basketball skills. So I think um, it's not possible to say exactly one is better than the other. I think it requires a lot of thinking of yourself as a coach, uh, what your team needs are, what your club expects, 
before you can answer that. My opinion though, um, I definitely tend more towards a creative motion style as a youth coach. Um, I think the younger the group of the players you're coaching, the more your offensive style should lean towards the creative motion concepts. Um, I think under 14 and younger, skill development and uh, with a combination of most uh, creative motion concepts is very important. Uh, as you get older, maybe under 16 or 18 level, skill development plus the combination of creative motion concepts with some set play ideas, uh, I think is important. Even if you choose to run a set play offense, um, you cannot run it effectively. Your players will not be able to run it effectively if they don't understand basic motion concepts. And what I mean by that is um, basic, what are basic motion concepts? Spacing, uh, what happens when I pass and I cut to the basket? What happens when a player drives to the basket? How do the other players react to this player? How do they, how do they move correctly when the player does this decision? Um, so if your players understand these basic concepts, then when they start playing set play basketball, they'll be much more effective in running those set plays. I mean, if you don't have good spacing or good uh, player movement uh, or correct player movement in your set play, your set play won't be effective anyways. On top of that, I think another style would be fast break basketball. I think regardless if you play set play or more motion offense, fast break basketball should be a key in all youth basketball. Players should learn to to sprint the floor when they get the ball, this, this uh, reaction of going from defense to offense, transitioning from defense to offense is a very key skill. And I think it's a skill that transfers to all levels. So I would definitely be a, a fan of teaching players fast break basketball as well, regardless of if I choose to play set player uh, motion offense. Uh, at the end of the day, I've highlighted this red because I think skills development should be the main priority. Um, regardless of if you are playing um, set play, creative motion, fast break, whatever it is, your players have to have the basic basketball skills. And you have to, as a coach, your job is to develop them in youth basketball. Um, if your players cannot dribble, pass, shoot, defend, pivot, whatever, all, all the bas basic skills in basketball, then it won't matter what you're playing because it won't be you won't be able to run it well if you you know if you want to run a set play with let's say two staggered screens and you're the player who's running out is not a good can't shoot the ball or your player who is dribbling the ball can't make a pass under pressure then it won't matter what you're running um that's the therefore the better your players basketball skills are the better your players can execute these basketball skills at a game speed and under pressure the better every system will be. And on top of that, when players feel that they're improving their skills, not only will they get more joy from the game, but they'll be more voted, more motivated to practice. And like I said, your team offense and your team game will automatically improve with the improvement of your players individual basketball skills. Um, so for me, role, role, the role of skills de uh, development is very important. Just a quick outline of things I believe, um, what skills and tactics should be taught or could be taught at different age groups. Um, I think under 12 and younger, the main focus should be installing a, a joy of basketball. Um, the players should start to learn and develop their love for the game and, and enjoy coming to the practice. You know, this, this we're trying to keep kids into the gym at this age. And so the, the game should be fun for them at that time. Uh, along with that, you want to develop their basic skills, um, not just basketball skills, but their motor skills of, of learning to run, to jump, to stop correctly, coordination, catching, things like this. Um, as you go to under 14, you want to continue working on those skills uh, basketball and motor skills and start to introduce the basic concepts of spacing, player movement, transition. Uh, for example, pass and cut game, uh, driving kick game. You want to start developing one-on-one -on -one skills, um, teaching players not only how to create an advantage on offense, but how to keep the advantage on offense. Um, as you move on to under 16 basketball, you would, of course, add on to those things. 
um, add on to your skill development, add on to your motor skill development. Um, and along with the basic concepts you learned in under 14, start to add two main game actions like, oh, you can add in dribble handoffs, uh, pick and rolls, post game actions, anything like this. But you basically, you're, you're building on the, the basic concepts you learned in under 14, taking the under 16 and, and slowly adding a few layers to it. And then as you go to under 18, you do the same thing. You know, you'd continue on those skills you learned in the, the age groups before, adding in more actions, maybe a little more complicated actions. Um, and maybe by under 18, you will start to introduce a more basic set play entries and actions to initiate your offense. Um, because if the player has gone through all these age levels in your club, then they should understand multiple actions and you should be able to build on them to create an advantage. Um, so I believe a combination of teaching players basketball skills, uh, motor skills, and a, a really targeted uh, continuation of motion skills and basic basketball skills and decision-making skills on up through to under 18 is important because then at that age, you can start to blend in some set play concepts because at the end of the day, players who have the goals of playing at a higher level need to understand what it means to, to have to run a set play because when they get into, let's say, college or professional basketball, they will be asked to run set plays uh, predominantly. And this requires a lot of understanding and focus from the player side. So I think it's good also at the under 18 level for players to understand a little bit of this. So this next topic, uh, effectively planning practices, a very important topic um, for every coach. I think before you can plan an individual practice, you have to kind of uh, develop a season overview um, you have to ask yourself a few questions. So, you know, how long is our season? When do our games start? How frequently do we play? How many how many practices a week do we have? Are we going to practice two times a week, three times a week? Do we get more practices a week? How long are we practicing? 90 minutes, 60 minutes, two hours? Um, I think all youth coaches have this problem. You know, I remember when I was in Austria, we had sometimes only three practices a week and they were 90 minutes. And you have games and you have a lot of stuff you want to get done. So to, to plan an effective practice, you have to have a good overview of your season and, and how many practices you're gonna have, how many games you have, and what you wanna teach the players. What skills do I wanna teach them? Which tactics do I wanna teach my team um, individually and as a team? Um, you have this concept of periodization in practice planning. Um, you start with the broad, which is the season overview, uh, my, my, uh, macro cycle, uh, you can break your season down usually into four phases, a preseason phase, a uh, competition phase one when the games start, a competition phase two as the games are kind of going from the second half of the season into maybe a playoffs and your off-season phase. Once you have it broken down from the macro, you can take it even farther down into a mesocycle, from there down into a micro cycle. Again, from there, you have your practice session. And I'll go through each one of these, um, these phases of periodization individually. Macro cycle. Um, here's my, my example. Let's say we have only we have about eight weeks of uh, preseason. I have down here um, it written out in a calendar. I put here preseason would be my August and September. Uh, competition phase one would be when the games start in October. I take this for four months into January. Comp sec uh, macro cycle three would be competition phase three, and then your off season. Um, and, as I think about each phase, I want to ask myself, you know, what's the main focus in each phase? What's the priorities in each phase? What are the goals in each phase? For example, my my priorities in preseason will be way different than my priorities in uh, the competition phase two. Um, you know, preseason for sure, a big priority is conditioning and and the development of basic concepts of what you want to teach that season. Once you have your macro cycles, for example, let's take competition phase one. From there, you can break that macro cycle down into four mesocycles. Um, here, we did it just in every month. So each month would be one mesocycle. And if I take October, I have October, there's four weeks. And I know in, that, in October, I'll have 12 practices in three games. So I know when I'm making my plan coming up in October, I have 12 practices, three games. What do I need to accomplish in those 12 practices? Going from there, you have your four micro cycles. So October, let's say you have four weeks. Each week would be one micro cycle. 
And I, I would also plan, okay, I know each week I have three practices in my three games. That's my 12 practices for that micro, uh, mesocycle and one game. For example, I'd say I take week two, I have three practices a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and a game Saturday. So I've gone from the, the macro cycle at the top to a meso cycle, so macro cycle, competition phase one, meso cycle, October, micro cycle, week two, and then into my practice session number two of the week. Um, later on in the presentation, I'll show you kind of a, pra uh, a hypothetical practice plan for this phase on this practice in this competition. Um, I believe there's three questions you have to ask to help you plan your practices. Um, the most important question is what do you need to what do you need or what do you want to accomplish that day? Um, and usually you want to only focus on one or two main points. I think if you're trying to do three, four, five main things in a practice, uh, your practice not only will be all over the place, they won't have any sort of flow and, and you won't you'll not get too much stuff done. Um, it's better to focus, especially in a 90 minute practice, on two main things and have everything kind of build into those main points. Um, the second question you need to ask yourself is how many players will be in practice. Uh, that'll make a big uh, impact, on, impact on what you do in practice. For example, if I know I'm only going to have six players in practice, obviously I can't do five on five, so I have to plan my practice accordingly. And so maybe then I would do more much more skill development or much uh, many more small sided games, a lot of one on one, two on two, three on three, things like this. If I know I'm going to have 12 or more players in practice, then I need to plan accordingly. Uh, on top of that, I need to know how much uh, equi what equipment I have or how much equipment I have. How many baskets am I going to have today? Am I going to have only one? Am I going to have two? Am I going to have six? How many basketball basketballs am I going to have? You know, if I have 12 players in practice, but only two basketballs, then I have to really think about what drills I can do to make an effective practice. Do I need cones in practice? Do I need uh, shirts, different colors? Um, you know, you need to really think about what exactly you need to have in your practice that you can uh, have an effective practice. Uh, some tips. To me, the most important tip I can give is write down and keep track of all practices. You know, you can use a notebook. You can use a a, a typed out sheet of paper um, that you made yourself. You can use a. There's tons of templates. I'll show some different uh, possibilities later on. Um, I can just say, for example. When I was coaching, a lot of times I'd use just a notebook and handwrite everything. This is what worked for me. Things I would write down, uh, point of emphasis for that practice. Um, I'd write down each drill, how long they should last. Uh, my teaching points for each drill, for example. You know, if I'd write down my drill, we'll, I'll show you the examples later on. For example, maybe I want to work on dribble penetration, and I write down and I have my drill daily dozen layups, and my teaching point next to what I have is uh, dynamic first step and square your shoulders. You know, I know when I read my practice plan, okay, yeah, when we talk about this drill, I wanna make those points. Um, if you know you're gonna be playing three on three or four on four and five on five, um, write down and create your teams before practice um, that you don't have to do it during the practice. Um, this will save a lot of time. And again, we're working with maybe 90 minutes, so we wanna save as much time as possible to use your time efficiently. efficiently. And also write down anything, any information, or any announcements you need to give the players um, or the team. Um, key thing is keep your practice plan with you during practice. Um, that way you can refer back to it. Um, I know there's been many times in practice where I go in, I'm like, oh, yeah, what's the next thing I want to do or what do I want to work on? And I always have to go back and look at my practice plan. If you don't want to carry, if you don't have a notebook, uh, maybe you want to write, use a note card. Um, and write down the small things on a note card to carry with you. You can fold up your practice plan, but I definitely recommend keeping your practice plan with you during the practice. Uh, and what does a practice plan do? Why is it important to, to write down a practice plan um, every day? Uh, because it helps you keep track of the drills you're doing. Um, it helps you keep track of what you worked on that you can refer back to them when you go to plan the next practice. Um, so I can say, hey, you know what? Last week, what did I do last week? I worked on drill X, Y, Z. So I'm gonna build on those, and this week I'm gonna work on uh, drills A, B, C to build on those drills. Um, as you're gonna plan your practice, 
you should think of your practice as like a book that should flow. There should be there should be really a beginning, a middle, and the end of every practice somehow. Um, and they should build on each other. Drills should be simple, and they should have some connection to the main focus or focuses. Um, just putting together 15 drills that don't have any sort of connection to each other is not a practice. You know, this is not uh, you. Your drills should make sense. They should they should flow from one to the other. Um, and again, they should all have a connection to the main focus. Very important to name your drills. Um, naming drills helps players uh, more quickly get into those drills, especially the ones that have done, been done in the past. For example, say you have a drill I put here, daily dozen, uh, daily dozen, daily dozen layups. If the players know what daily dozen mean, they know automatically, hey guys, let's go, we start daily dozen layups, they can get into it much quicker. Um, so so name, your, name your drills, that way the players can learn them and that you even more quickly get into the drills. Um, and I would say the plan that the majority of drills will be between five and 10 minutes. Um, it is possible that some drills go longer in the 15 minute range, especially as you start playing five on five. Maybe you have drills that are uh, five on five is going to be maybe 15, 20 minutes. Um, this is also possible, but I would say the majority of the drills are gonna be between five and 10 minutes. Um, and if you plan a drill to be 10 minutes, and I think every coach has had this experience, you plan a drill to go 10 minutes, the drill doesn't work for some reason. You know, players either don't understand it or the coach doesn't explain it well. Um, for whatever reason, it's not working well. You know, coaches then have a tendency to, to push through and try to drag the drill on until the players get it. And sometimes the drills take them 15, 20, 25 minutes, where sometimes the better option is just to say it after the 10 minutes, whistle the drill dead, bring the team together, go, hey guys, that drill, we didn't do a good job. Um, let's move on to the next one. Let's make the next drill better. And we'll get back to this drill and try to do it better in the next practice. This all goes into using your time efficiently in practice. Um, I would say the majority of the teams that I coached in, especially at the youth level, if you had practice at six o'clock, um, there would be a team on the gym, on the court before you practicing until six o'clock. So you couldn't get on the court early. Regardless, you should have a rule that your player should be in practice 15 minutes beforehand. Um, that way, especially if you don't get on the gym until six, that when six o'clock does come, you can start right away. Um, things you can do during those 15 minutes before you get on the court, you can talk to players individually, you can talk to them as a group, you can let them stretch individually, um, you can give them the information about what the first drills and practice are gonna be, that way they can more quickly get into those drills. There's a lot of options. Um, I mentioned this in the slide before, your drills should flow logically and build upon each other. Um, you should also think about, you know, are you spending more time talking, explaining your drills or, or talking during the drills and the players are executing them? Um, is that because your drills are too complicated for the players? You know, coaches have a tendency to see these really complex uh, drills and think they're gonna be great. Uh, I've had, my experience has been that the, the simpler the drill has been, the better. Um, players don't care how cool your drill looks as long as it's an effective drill and they get something from it. I wrote down here KISS concept. Uh, this is something I really believe in. It stands, for, I, I say it's keep it simple and smart. Um, and this goes in a lot of concepts in basketball, I believe, um, but especially in drill selection. You know, keep it simple. You, know, you don't have to do anything complex. If you can, try to use the plus one method of uh, planning your drills and practices. And what I mean by this is, can you build up your drills one after another that you only need to add maybe one line or one more ball to go into the next drill. I made an example here. Say you're doing classic one on zero layups on two baskets. From this, you can quickly add in two, go into two on zero driving kick practice just by using a second uh, line and then go from there right into two on one. So your drills can easily, so this drill can easily go just by adding one thing can go from one to the next. Um, and an important question, do your drills allow for maximum player uh, involvement? Um, are your players consistently engaged in the drills? Are they standing and waiting in lines? Um, do you get maximum amount of rep do the players get the maximum amount of repetitions? Um, can you improve your drills by using more basketballs or, or increasing the number of players involved in the drill? I think these are all things that a coach has to think about when you go into planning the practice. Um, and again, do your drills connect to that practice's point of emphasis? 
are you doing a drill because it has a purpose or are you doing a drill just to do a drill? Um, and if we're talking about using practice time efficiently, you want to be able to answer all those things. Um, so I went through this mesocycle, microcycle uh, as a hypothetical practice. If I was going to pl uh, plan a practice for that phase of the competition, here's an example of a potential practice plan. You know, I run up top, U16 boys, the date, the, the number of practice this is, though this is the 15th practice in the season, how much time I have, I have my em emphasis of the day, offensive is dribble penetration, defense, help on drives, I have my number of players or attendance is 12. And as you see, you know, on the left side, I have the time for each drill, the middle is the drill each name, and I have my teaching points. And I can carry this practice plan with me and always refer back to it. And everything layers up, like I said, you know, my main emphasis is dribble penetration. So I have here my daily dozen layups. This goes directly into driving it into the basket, then my two on zero driving kick, into two on two drive and kick game, um, and everything kind of builds upon each other. To end, I just want to show some examples of a practice plan. Um, this is a screenshot of the, the practice plan or the notebook I used last season when I was coaching the, the BBL team here for a few months. Um, for me, I preferred, I've always preferred writing my uh, practice plans uh, with pen and paper. Um, you can see here, I keep it, I have it all with me all the time. Um, for me, this worked. Um, I had all my notes on here, I had my teams, I had my times. You see on the bottom in red, I had my review of practice. Uh, after the practice, I would sit down and think about, you know, what was good, what was bad, I'd write it down so I could always go back to it later on when I wanted to plan the next practice. Um, this season, our coach used um, printed practice plans. Um, you see here, same concept. You know, we have the date, you have the time, you have the practice number. He wrote down the teams we wanted to use, red and white. Um, he had the drills. He had the, the times each was going to take. He had the, the points, the teaching points on there. He would, we would give this out to each coach. I know we had, you know, professional level, we have more assistant coaches and staff. So each member of the staff and the assistant coaches also got a copy of this that they could follow the practice along and understand what was going to come next or maybe who was um, in charge of that drill. Here's a blank example of a practice plan. So let, here's three examples um, from handwritten to more complex to very basic. Uh, whatever you choose, I think it should fit to you. If you feel like you want to handwrite, you're, you're more comfortable doing that, then do that. If you are more um, comfortable using a computer and, and typing things out and using them that way, then do that. I think every coach needs to find their own way in that, um, in that regard. And there, like I said, there is no right or wrong answer. As long as you are writing your practice plans down and, and keeping track of them, that you can better plan your season and better plan the next practices. Just, I know there's a lot of youth coaches on there. Um, last thing, there's a lot of online coaching resources. Um, I just listed some of them here. Um, if you need help, go online, look everywhere. There's a bunch of great resources online. Uh, there's a bunch of great coaching clinics going on the last weeks and coming up in the future. I also wrote down my email address if player, if anybody wants to get in contact with me uh, for whatever reason, help with stuff, um, ideas. I, I'll gladly email email out this um, presentation to anybody that would like it. Um, so other than that, that's the end of my presentation. So I would say thank you very much. I know maybe we have some questions now. Yeah, coach, uh, thank you very much. Really, really appreciate the stuff you just uh, presented. And I know it's gonna be useful for, for obviously all our listeners. Uh, we've just got a couple of questions here, so I'm going to fire them off to you, um, and, and let's see if we can help some of our attendees. So the first one is, uh, when you talked about the N12s and you said it's really important to instill love of the game, so how would you suggest that this can be done to allow players to start developing that love of the game uh, within a practice setting? I think... As a youth basketball player, under 10, under 12, um, you want to make the practices as fun as possible. You want to include a lot of games, um, a lot of different type of games in, in your practices. 
that the players enjoy coming to the practice. You know, there's there's old saying that, you know, the practices are for the coaches and the, the games are for the players. But this is at a high level, and I don't, I don't agree with this. I think in youth basketball, especially under 12, under 10, the, the game should be fun for the players. You know, it's not a job for them. It's not a, a requirement for them. They should want to come to practice. And I would just suggest creating a bunch of games, you know, anything you can think of to make the game fun where they want to be in practice. If kids, if kids think something is fun, they're going to want to do more of it. Um, so the more fun you can make a practice, um, at the under 10, under 12 level, the more likely the player is going to enjoy it and the more likely they're going to keep playing basketball and then start to develop that uh, love of playing. Gotcha. Perfect. Uh, next question we have there is, so you mentioned in the practice planning, uh, obviously you mentioned the micro cycles, meso cycles. So question from coaches, how would you plan your cycles if you only have one session, one practice session a week and a game on the weekend or two practice sessions on the week and no games on the weekend. Uh, so the contact time with some of the coaches in Ireland uh, and some of the clubs is very limited. So mm -hmm. how would you go about doing that in that scenario? I think you can still do it in a very similar way. I mean, I think even if you only practice twice a week or once a week and maybe don't have games every weekend, um, you still have a beginning and an end of your season. You know, your, your season is still going to start at a certain month or a certain week and end at a certain month or week. So you can still start with your hole and say, hey, when does my season start? When does my season end? Um, and break it down from there. You know, so my macro cycles would be big, uh, taken from this full season. Um, I don't know exactly what it li is like in Ireland. Um, let's say you only have, I don't know, six months of a season with practice. So, you know, you practice from November until six months later um, is your, your, your last game. So you start from there and just slow, try to break it down as much as you can that you can much more easily plan what you want to accomplish and what you want to do as a whole and then from week to week. Um, so I, I think the process would be very similar. Just find out where you start with your practices and find out when your last game is and then go from there. Gotcha. Um, next question there for yourself is looking back at your journey, looking back at your career, what advice would you give to your younger self, the, the, the coach that just started his coaching journey? What would you tell him? Uh, most important advice. Most important advice. Um, wow. When I think back, first of all, I was when I think back, I was very bad. <laughs> I think I was not that great of a coach. Um, I think as a young coach, my advice to my to so my advice to myself would be: don't be afraid to teach basketball. Don't uh, don't go for success. Um, don't sacrifice developing your players um, just for short-term success. I think you'll derive much more joy out of coaching, seeing your players develop as players and seeing your team develop as a group than short-term success. I think um, this is where the set play versus motion kind of comes in. I remember when I was starting out, you know, I didn't know how to teach certain things. So, of course, I went to set plays. I, I watched uh, the, the teams that were higher than me and um, – try to take stuff from them. Um, luckily, I had a very good mentor when I was in Gumulman, um, and he helped me a lot to learn how to teach basketball. So that would be my advice to any young coach. If you are unsure or don't know, um, find someone who you think is a good basketball coach and, and ask them. I would say most coaches are very willing to share their knowledge and um, because I think we all want the same thing. I think all coaches would like that the basketball is continues to be popular and is very well played. And um, so search, look for a mentor, someone that you believe can really help you. Excellent. I just want to echo on Coach's point. He, he said when he first started, uh, he said he's not very good. I think um, most coaches would actually say that. I know myself, um, I was awful. I was absolutely atrocious as a coach when I first started. And I think now where I'm at, I'm, you know, so la la, but uh, obviously then it's, it, it, it's something that you strive to get better uh, every day and you keep learning. Yeah. Uh, again, just, just to, to echo on coach's point. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, when I started all these things I was talking about now, I made all these mistakes. My practices, I just, I just put drills together just because I thought they were cool. I read a book or I saw a drill online. I was like, oh, that's a cool drill. Let's do this. It did have, it had no connection to what uh, maybe the, the main point was, I mean, 
these are all mistakes I think every young coach makes. And that's why it's important to, to take coaching clinics, to read other books, to, to talk to other coaches that have had experience because they can help you out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, well, guys, if, if anybody has any more questions, just fire them away to us. We're obviously uh, going to continue with Aoife Callahan coming on shortly. But if you tweet your questions to us uh, or if you just fire your questions across this platform, we'll, we'll make sure to answer them. Uh, Coach, thank you so much for your time.